best and the goodliest vines that one could find. And he planted them in that good ground. And he nourished them with water. And the sunshine blessed them. And the vineyard began to grow. The man who planted the vineyard also put a tower in the vineyard. A watchtower. To keep out the varmints and the critters that would come in and seek to destroy the vineyard. He did all of that that he may produce good grapes. The Bible tells us in that fifth chapter there that when the harvest time came, he went down into the vineyard and all that he found were wild grapes. Sour, not fit for consumption, fit for nothing but to be torn down and cast into the heap and burned. The man that planted the vineyard in that story in Isaiah 5 asked a question. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I, what I did? What more could God have done to save your soul than to send forth His only Son, conceived of the virgin had no earthly father, had no sin nature, born sinlessly perfect, God in flesh, co-equal, co-existent with God, lived that perfect sinless life, and then at the time of His choosing, at the age of 33, He went to the cross and took all the sin of all the world of all time into His own body hung there and bled and died on that cross dismissing his spirit and dying at the very second of his own choosing to fulfill his will and yet today rather than being revered by the world by, rather than being respected by the world rather than being accepted by the world he's rejected he becomes the punchline of jokes they make fun of him. They make light of him. <coughs> they say he doesn't matter. That he's just one religion of thousands of religions. And then the world makes fun of his penalty for sin. And they make such stupid and ridiculous jokes about hell. One that I've heard for years that degrades women says, Hell hath no fury like the scorn of a woman. We're going to find out tonight that never a woman lived that had a scorn like hell possesses. In Revelation chapter number 9, we scratched the surface a little bit last Wednesday night when the fifth trumpet sounds. Now again, we're in the tribulation period. The church is gone. The church was raptured out back in Revelation chapter 4. And all of us that have been born again, we're with the Lord now. We've gone through the judgment seat of Christ and we're with Him. We're worshiping and praising Him. We're around His throne. While all of this horror and terror is being poured out upon the world, judgment has come on sin. The Bible says in Revelation 9, 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Keep in mind that this is not uh, a, a novel to be read. This is truth. This is the word of God. This is a literal. This is a literal thing that is going to happen uh, when the fifth trumpet of uh, God's judgment is blown upon the world uh, during this tribulation period of time. The Bible says, "And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power 
as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So the only people that these demons that are going to come out of hell are going to torment are lost people. The people who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. <coughs> and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Would you believe that there is the possibility this evening that there may be someone sitting in this auditorium who will live to have to endure this? If there's anyone in here that's lost without Christ and you choose to never be saved, if you live unto the coming of the Lord and uh, you are here for the tribulation period, if you don't die during the seven seals that were opened previously and you don't die between the first uh, four seal, the first four trumpets that are blown, if you are happen to still be here, uh, you're going to endure this. And I want you to understand verse 6 and it's literal warning that in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Let's pray. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word of God tonight. We ask your blessings be upon it. We pray, our Father, that, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts tonight. Father, I pray that you'd speak to my heart as I try to preach this message. Lord, I had a very difficult time last Wednesday night. I feel like I failed you and let you down. Lord, tonight I don't want to do that. I pray that you'll help me and fill me and anoint me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Overshadow me, Lord. Lord, you direct my thoughts and my heart what to say. We'll thank you for it pray you touch the hearts of the people here tonight. I pray that everyone in this building is saved. But Lord, I know that there may be some that are not. But I don't know who they are, Lord, but you do. I pray you touch their heart. While there's still yet time to come to Christ and be saved. But Lord, I wouldn't wish these events of Trumpet 5 on my worst enemy. But Lord, they're going to happen. They're going to be poured out on those who have rejected the love of the truth that they might be saved. Dear Lord, they're going to suffer the horrors of hell. Help us to have a burden for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, I, I began to get, give an introduction of this trumpet and uh, talk about the situations that are going on in our land and how that evil and wickedness and uh, the things of Satan are already and for years have been duping the, the multitudes, the masses of people on planet earth and, and uh, teaching them that the things of Satan and the things of the devil are uh, just harmless little bits of fun. Uh, but we know better than that. But when we come to this trumpet, this trumpet is blown here in Revelation chapter number 9, uh, the, the bottomless pit will be opened up. Hell will be opened. And uh, the Bible tells us about these demons, these creatures that are going to come up out of the bottomless pit. Now, you know as well as I do from our studies over the last several weeks of this book of the Bible that 
when uh, in the revelation, when the Holy Spirit inspired it, uh, he was very careful uh, when he was giving it to John to let John know when something was going to be symbolic. And uh, he would use the phrase, as it were. And we see that phrase used many times in the description of these uh, locusts, these beasts that will come out of hell when this fifth trumpet is sounded. So when we read the description of these, we must understand that these creatures that are going to come up out of the bottomless pit, they're real. Their presence upon earth is not symbolic. It's real. Their, their methods and, and their mission uh, to torment man, uh, mankind for 150 days, that's not symbolic. That is real. That's going to happen. But when we look at these beasts, we, we see that uh, they say they have breastplates of iron, but it says as it were iron. It says they have crowns of gold on their head, but they have crowns as it were gold. And uh, so we read their description and we learn the symbolism of what these beasts are going to do and the power that they're given and how they will torment man for five months, 150 days, and uh, we, we could not sit here and take this uh, description of them and draw it out as an artist would draw a picture and say, that's exactly what they're going to look like. That's not what the Bible is telling us. The Bible is telling us about their character and their description describes their character and their character describes the mission that they are there to fulfill. I want to remind us first of all that their mission is not to kill mankind. Their mission is not to kill the vegetation of the earth. Now, when locusts swarm, when locusts invade the earth, and uh, there's been a big swarm of locusts going on over in uh, uh, parts of Africa and Southeast Asia now. Uh, it started in 2019, and it's broken all the norms. I think it's significant in the Bible that the Bible says that these beasts, they are equated to locusts, and that they're going to swarm uh, for five months. When I was researching this uh, uh, for this message, I, I come to understand uh, that the United Nations uh, uh, outfit that deals with uh, agriculture, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, I read about their, their writings about locusts. And I found that it was amazing that normally when locusts strike, they strike between April and August, and they normally swarm for that period, which, would you believe, is five months. The normal swarm period of locusts are five months. Now while I'm, while I'm referring to them, let me give you just a little bit of information to try to give you some sort of a sense of a scale here of the magnitude of these beasts that are going to be coming up out of the bottomless pit. They're not going to come out in ones and twos. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization tell us that normal swarms of locusts contain tens of billions of locusts. One swarm can be as large as 100 square miles with 40 to 80 million locusts packed into every square mile. Now, the Lord didn't uh, the Lord could have picked out pigs or cows or or donkeys, or anything he wanted to, but he chose locusts to describe uh, the horror of these uh, satanic beasts that are going to come up out of the pit of hell during the tribulation period and torment men for five months. I want you to see the, the extreme magnitude of, of, of these things that are going to be coming up out of the bottomless pit to torment man for five months. I started giving you a little bit of a description last week of the character of these beasts. Let's look at those again right quick. And then I've just got some verses of Scripture that I want to close with that I want you to think about. We find first of all that these uh, beasts have been incarcerated down in hell. Uh, they, they are not currently on the earth. They are not down here now. Uh, they, are, they will be unleashed during the tribulation period. And the Bible tells us that their origin, they will come out of the pit of hell. And they'll tell us that they will not be able to be satisfied. I want you to look in verse number 3. The Bible tells us that they come up out of the pit. 
They came up from the smoke out of the pit, and power was given unto them. Verse 3, and power was given as the scorpions of the earth have power. In verse number 4, we find uh, that they were commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, you got to understand, that's the 144,000 witnesses and they will not be affected by these locusts. Only lost people, only people who have rejected the Lord and do not know the Lord and have lived through the first judgments that God has already put down upon this world. Five months they're going to, they're going to uh, torment mankind, the Bible says in verses 5 and 6, and their torment will be as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now that's not going to be the only torment that man is going to feel. I want you to understand, as I said last week, there are very few, but there are some species of uh, scorpions who have enough venom in them, enough toxicity in their, in their venom to literally kill a man. But I don't believe these are the scorpions that, they will be, that, that will be used for this torment because the Bible says they're not going to kill man. They're just going to torment him. Most scorpion strikes uh, cause, uh, cause great pain and a great swelling, but they don't kill a man. And so they're equated to the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in verse number six, we're reminded that they are going to uh, be so, uh, uh, they're going to be so tormenting that man is going to try to find death and death is going to evade him. Uh, we uh, begin to look also uh, that these beasts not only uh, are very, uh, Im- they're impossible to, to uh, satisfy, uh, they're going to just go after everyone that they can find. Uh, they will possess no mercy. They will possess no grace about them. They will have no, they will not be tolerant of man's begging and man's pleading. We find also that they're fearless and they're unflinching and they're very daring creatures. That's why the Lord described them as horses. That's why horses were used in battle uh, because of their courage and their bravery and their tenacity and their ability uh, to uh, stay in the fight and not turn and run away. We also find here, we talk about how that these uh, demons coming out of the ground uh, or out of the bottomless pit, uh, they'll, they'll be nearly invincible. That you, that man will have no defense against, against them. Uh, you're not going to run out of the house with your shotgun or your 45 pistol and, and start shooting these things. How are you going to? How are you going to defense yourself against billions, literally build tens of billions of these little creatures? They're going to be coming up out of the out of the pit of hell who have been down there for the ages and now they've been released. They know their mission. They know their leader. They've received their power and their job is to torment man to the point of death and man will not find death. They are, they are invincible. Then the Bible tells us that they had the faces of men uh, which tell us that they uh, have an intelligence about them. Uh, they're not just brute animals. They have got an intelligence about them and they know what it is that they're doing. And then the Bible tells us that uh, over in, in verse number 8, I want you to look at verse 8 for just a moment. It says, and they had hair as the hair of women. Now what possibly part could that play uh, in the torment of mankind? Well, you know over in the book of 1 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that the woman, a woman's long hair is part of her glory. Uh, is part of her alluring. is part of her beauty. And uh, these creatures, you would think, boy, I'm going to run away from these things. But no, they're going to have an alluring quality about them. That men are going to be drawn to them. And when I say not men, I don't mean man, men, I mean mankind, will be drawn to these things. There will be some kind of a pleasurable power that these things will have to draw men unto them just for them to infect their sting and to torment these people for five months upon the earth. And then the Bible tells us in verse 8 that they have teeth of lions. Man, what a description. How many of you have ever seen a lion? A real lion, not a picture of one, but you've seen one. How many of you have seen one in the wild? Oh, you've seen them in a zoo, had not you? You've seen them behind an enclosure. You've seen them in that poor zoo and now they're depressed. They don't 
have no drive to do nothing. They just lay around and lick your feet. That's all I've ever seen them do. But you get one of them rascals out in the wild and those things are much bigger than a man. Their, 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 their paws are as big as your head. And their claws. And the Bible tells us that these beasts will be a, a toothed beast, but it'll, it's not just any tooth, it's the teeth of lions. So I thought, well, I'm gonna, I don't know much about a lion, and I don't know much about the teeth of a lion, and so I decided I'd do a little investigating. I found out that, that lions uh, have three types of teeth in their mouth. I know, I know that adults, uh, uh, humans, have different types of teeth. And like a human, an adult has, uh, has incisors. And they're used to grip their prey. And they're used to rip it and tear it to shreds. And uh, then, they have, uh, then they have canines. We have canines in our teeth as well, in our mouth as well. And those canines are used for holding the prey. Uh, they won't, you can't get away from them. And uh, then they have uh, teeth that are called, uh, uh, I, I, can't, I don't, don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, but they have carcinacial teeth. And uh, those teeth are for the cutting. Now it is those teeth and those canine teeth in a line are four inches long. Now can you imagine having some critter the size of a locust come out of the bottomless pit with gigantic teeth like that, and that thing grab a hold of you and sink them teeth into your body and you can't get away from them? How many of you ever been stung by a bee? Boy, you want to get rid of, you want to get away from that thing, don't you? You go to swat and you go to whapping at that thing, and all you do is pushing that stinger down in there further. Amen. And uh, man, you just you, you want to get away from that thing, and eventually you get away from it. But imagine one of these creatures latching onto you with teeth as a lion. I mean, they rip you to shreds, but you don't die. And then the Bible tells us in verse 9 that they're insensitive because they have breastplates of iron. They have no mercy, and of course they have no grace. And all of your cries fall upon deaf ears. They have not a heart that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities like the Lord Jesus does. And then the Bible tells us that they're going to be inescapable. Tell me, where are you going to hide? Where are you going to hide from these things? These creatures that are, are, have come to torment and to abuse and to, 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 to cause great pain and sorrow in the human body of those who have rejected Christ. I bet they're not making jokes about hell then. I bet they're not making funny jokes about Jesus then. But next week, well, I don't want to spoil that. And so the Bible tells us that they've come to injure man. And the Bible tells us that they're organized. They have a leader. They don't just come up out of hell during this trumpet. Some of you may be sitting here thinking, Preacher, this is the wildest thing I've ever heard come out of your mouth. Why don't you preach the gospel? Well, these people didn't listen to the gospel when they had a the chance. That's why, they're, that's why they're feeling this. The Bible says that their leader's name in the Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek it's Apollyon. Both of those names mean the destroyer. And I believe that the one that opened the bottomless pit, and I believe the king of the bottomless pit of these creatures is none other than Satan himself. And then 150 days after it started, it'll stop as quickly as it started. And the Bible says one woe is past. Man's going to get a little breather. And try to regroup. And try to get his senses back about him for just a moment. This could happen to your neighbors. This could happen to your friends. This could happen to family members. 
It's not that it could happen. It, it will happen if they live unto this day. When I opened the message tonight, I talked about Isaiah for a moment, didn't I? It nearly breaks your heart when you read that passage of Scripture there in Isaiah 5. And we see the labor and the love and the faithfulness of the Master to provide everything that a vineyard would need to thrive and to grow and to be strong. The vineyard is His people. The vineyard is us. God sent His only begotten Son into the world to pay for the sins of this vineyard because we turned out like wild grapes. We're, we're, we're by nature sinners, aliens of God, enemies of God because of our sin nature brought into the world by Adam. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus told a parable about a vineyard, did He not? And every time that the master would send a prophet into that vineyard, they'd kill that prophet. They would reject that prophet. They would reject his message. They would reject God's mercy. They would reject God's grace. And then the Lord said, I'll send my son down there. And they killed him too. What more could God do for man than what he's done? There's an old saying, those who refuse to listen have to feel. And that's what's happening when the fifth trumpet is sounded. I want you to think on some verses as I close the message tonight. John chapter 1 verse 11 the Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. He rejected again. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them which that believe on his name. The psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor, turn, nor such as turn aside the lies. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. They rejected. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. They reject it. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 23. The Lord says, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. The Lord said, I love you. I know you're a sinner. I know you're my enemy, but I, I love you and I want you to be saved. And, and so I give you my word. I send you my word to show you the way. But the Lord says, because I have called and ye have refused. 
I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it naught, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. Listen carefully. God says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall ye call upon me and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. He says, come to me. You ever been out visiting and somebody slam a door in your face? That hurt, didn't it? It does, it hurt. Never forget one night we were out visiting. I had my daughter Amanda with me. And she knocked on the door, and this man come to the door, and she said, "My name is so and so." And she reached out a track, and he slammed the door right in her face, and she just stood there and cried. It hurts. But all this bunch today that says, "Leave me alone! I don't want God. Leave me alone!" In that day, they'll get their wish. And they'll go screaming and crying for God, but it's too late. God will not answer them. But in the final analysis, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, tell us what will happen in the final analysis. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine the horror of living through that fifth trumpet? And then you'll fall on your knees and say, yes, He is Lord just before you cast in the lake of fire. These are dark days in the book of Revelation. They're hard to preach. You just can't rear back with joy and preach this like you can a message on salvation or a message on heaven or a message on grace or the cross. You have to tread lightly. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the message tonight and Lord, as we finish looking at the, these horrible beasts that will come out of this bottomless pit to torment man, we thank you, personally thank you tonight for your mercy and grace. Thank you for saving us, Lord, when we called upon your name. Lord, we're still in the day of grace. Grace is available to whosoever will, regardless of who they are, where they came from, or the sins they've committed. There's mercy, there's grace. The blood of Christ is still fresh and flowing to wash away those sins, and to take that enemy of God and transform them into a child of God and save their soul. Take them to heaven someday when they come to die. Father, you know the hearts of each one here tonight. Lord, I just pray that if there be any in this building tonight that doesn't know you as Savior. But in the quietness of this moment, as we dismiss the service, our study time is over tonight. Our teaching time is over tonight. Lord, before they walk out of this door, they can right now call on the name of Jesus and ask for mercy, ask for forgiveness of their sins, be willing to repent of them, turn away from their sin and their sinful life and turn unto God. 
the Bible says that if a man will confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So I pray that if there's anyone here tonight, visitor, member, Lord, you know the heart, and only you know the heart. Pray that someone would be saved tonight. Dismiss our Wednesday night service with your grace. Bless and be with each one as they depart from here. Keep them safe. Lord, bring us back on the Lord's day if it be thy will. Once again, Lord, we ask your blessing, and your presence, and your mercy and grace upon all the requests of prayer that was lifted up tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.